From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Dermatology Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Dermatology. Hello and welcome to this author interview from the JAMA Network. This is Dr. Ade Adamson, the web editor for JAMA Dermatology. Alopecia areata is an autoimmune disease with a lifetime prevalence of roughly 2%. It is a disorder that is characterized by hair loss that can range from a single patch to more extensive forms, including alopecia totalis and universalis. Treatments for this disorder can vary, and recent practice patterns in the United States have not been well described. In a new study in JAMA Dermatology, authors aim to describe treatment patterns for patients with alopecia areata, as well as for those with alopecia totalis or alopecia universalis. Dr. Kathy Huang is an assistant professor in the Department of Dermatology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She's the corresponding author of this new study, and she's here to discuss this work. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Huang. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. So before we begin, I always ask our guests on the podcast, well, what do they do? I think what you do actually is extremely relevant to why you chose this topic. What is your role at the Brigham and Women's Hospital? At Brigham and Women's Hospital, I'm one of the co-directors for the Hair Loss Clinic, where we, over the last 13 years, we've grown our clinic to expand to both local and regional referrals. We treat common hair loss conditions and rare hair loss conditions. And so it's been a really rewarding clinic to be part of. And so this is obviously why you decided to study alopecia areata, because that's probably one of the more common disorders that you see in your hair loss clinic, correct? Definitely. Alopecia areata, as you mentioned, is a common form of hair loss, but we really lag behind in terms of research and treatment options. And it wasn't really until last year that we actually had our first FDA-approved treatment for alopecia areata. And that was after we actually started this project. So we were excited to see that news. Yeah. So not only were there no FDA approved medicines for it, but there was also a lot of varied ways in which people or physicians treated alopecia areata. And for the audience, do you mind telling them what is the range of things? I mean, there's like interlesional catalog, there's systemic or intramuscular catalog treatment and others. That's exactly right. There's such a range of treatments and there's no consensus on what's the best algorithm for treating alopecia areata. It ranges from topical local therapy, which would be topical anti-inflammatories, including topical steroids or topical tacrolimus. Um, You have other topical therapies that stimulate the immune system, such as squaric acid. We also have the option to deliver corticosteroids with intralesional injections. Uh, You can administer it orally or intramuscularly. There are other systemic treatments that are anti-inflammatory, including methotrexate, cyclosporin, and now we have the category of uh, Janus kinase inhibitors, which are otherwise known as JAK inhibitors, which can help decrease the inflammation that is driving alopecia areata. Yeah, so with all of these different types of treatment, there were no like recent studies that are you know population based of like in the entire United States trying to look at this question of how are people being treated with these different modalities and are they getting repeat treatments with these different modalities because a lot of the treatments that you describe they often take a few visits for you to have to administer, particularly the ones that involve a procedure. And so what you all wanted to do is try to figure out what were these patterns and how often are people actually coming back for their treatment? Is that a fair assessment of the scope of the problem you were trying to study? Yes. We're not looking at how often they're coming in, the number of visits, but we are looking at what are the treatments they are getting over the course of a year. So we have one of the figures, the Sankey plot, which can show the dynamic changes of the treatment categories that people are in. And if they are in treatment, what treatments are they on or are they not treated at all? So we looked at the time points of the day of diagnosis and also six weeks out, 12 weeks out, and then one year to see if they're on treatment and what kind of treatment they're on. So this is a relatively difficult thing to study, right? What data source did you use to study this question in this manuscript? 
We use the IBM Market Scan database and use the ATN platform to access this data. And this is a database that has millions of individuals who are covered with commercial insurance. And it also provides information about other medical issues that they might have, treatments that were prescribed, and procedures that were performed. So we were able to see if they had, for example, intralesional injections administered, or if they had laser or phototherapy procedure, or if a prescription prescribed by the provider they saw. So you use this database and uh, you selected for patients that were insured for a year so you could actually follow what they had done over that year. And you only looked at adults. And how many patients overall were you able to follow in this cohort that has millions of patients? Because obviously there's only a small proportion of that that uh, actually have alopecia areata. That's right. When we identified patients with alopecia areata, we were able to identify over 45,000 individuals with alopecia areata. And what we did was we tried to ensure that this was a new diagnosis by having a one-year washout period with no AA diagnosis. And then we started following them from that AA diagnosis to one year post that diagnosis. And what were you looking for in that uh, one year from diagnosis onward? What were some of the variables that you were looking at or treatments that you were looking at? What we were looking at were injections with corticosteroids, topical steroid prescriptions, intramuscular steroid treatments, oral steroids, other oral immunosuppressants, including cyclosporine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofetil, JAK inhibitors, and DPCP, which is the topical stimulant, and narrowband UVB. So we basically searched for all these types of treatments to see what was being administered. And what was your overall finding? How often were patients that were diagnosed actually given any treatment at all? And what were some of the more common treatments that patients received after diagnosis? So we found that 66% of patients had at least one treatment over the whole 365 days. Of these treatments, the most common treatment were intralesional steroids, which was around 40% of the patients. And that was followed by topical steroids, intramuscular corticosteroids, and oral steroids. And when we looked more longitudinally about who had treatment and what treatments were used, on day one, 47% of patients had no treatment at all. So almost half of the patients did not start with treatment when they were diagnosed. And of these patients who were not treated, 83% continued to be not on treatment at six weeks. By one year, 72% of patients were not on treatment at all for this alopecia areata diagnosis. Is this surprising to you? I was surprised by it. I was surprised that not more patients were on treatment at diagnosis. And I was surprised that there was such a high percentage of patients who were not on any therapy at the end of the year. And this raised a lot of questions on why someone would not be on therapy because there could be a lot of explanations for this. One of the explanations is that maybe the alopecia areata is not active in a year. Is it possible that they resolved? Is it possible that if they were on treatment, the treatment worked? Or maybe the treatment did not work, so they stopped treatment? Or maybe they had side effects on the treatment? So those were a lot of the questions that were raised based on this high percentage of patients not being treated after a year. But the answers to those questions are probably beyond the scope of the paper that you've put together and the access to the data that you had, such as the market scan like this. You don't necessarily know what the motivations are for why patients would maybe forego treatment. You also aren't sure of the severity. Like you said, maybe some of them spontaneously resolve because this is a relapsing rem remitting disorder. Exactly right. It would be amazing to have that data, more granular data about what was active at the time of diagnosis. We know they got the diagnosis at that point, but how active were they? We do have data on whether or not they were in the severe category of alopecia areata totalis or universalis, but we don't know if they had 20% of their scalp involved or 45% of their scalp involved at that time. Or even where on their scalp is involved. You know, right. some people, if it's right on the you know back of their head, they can't see it. You know, maybe it's something that they are less apt to treat. 
But as you mentioned, you did have access to data on patients that uh, were categorized as alopecia universalis or totalis. Were their treatment patterns different than the overall cohort of alopecia areata patients? Meaning, perhaps, did, did they get more aggressive treatment? Were they more likely to be on treatment at a year? Were there any differences? Yeah, there were some differences. Uh, we were able to split them up into those two groups of patchy alopecia areata or patients with alopecia areata totalis or universalis. And we found that patients with the more severe alopecia areata had less of the treatment with intralesional triamcinolone and less of the topical therapy. So they had similar doses of oral corticosteroids prescribed, and those were the main findings we found for the differences for the alopecia areata totalis versus the non-alopecia areata totalis patients. And you all also had an interest in looking at the provider types that were involved in the diagnosis and treatment of patients. Did you find any differences in practice patterns based on this specialty? Yes, we found that patients who were treated by a dermatologist were more likely to have intralesional steroid injections. So that would be 53% versus 25% in the patients who were treated. And this makes sense because this is is like a very common procedure performed by dermatologists in our offices and maybe not as commonly administered in non-dermatology offices. Out of curiosity, what were the other specialists or physician categories that were treating patients with alopecia areata? Was this mostly primary care or were there some others that maybe surprised you? That's a really good question. We just pulled out the patients treated by dermatology, but we didn't actually interrogate who the other specialists were. But that would be a really interesting question to look at. Yeah, maybe a follow-up study. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, actually, that segues me into asking you about, you know, what's next? You know, you you found a surprising finding to your eyes as a specialist in the care of patients with hair loss. Are there any plans in trying to investigate why is it that there is a lot less treatment of alopecia areata after a diagnosis than you would imagine? Yes, I think that would be definitely a question we'd be interested in trying to answer. We would need, I think, some data set that has more granular data or information about severity of the alopecia areata over time during the treatment course. And that would be also a way for us to understand if the severity had anything to do with whether or not patients were on treatments in the end. It would also be really interesting to get more information on what the the patients were feeling at the end of the year. So for example, like a survey study to find out how their patient experience was over that year. But now I feel like there are new, a lot of new treatments that are emerging for alopecia areata. So this question would look so much different in just maybe three or four years, Uh, especially now that we have new therapies that are emerging. It would be interesting to see what the practice patterns look like at that point And the new therapies look like they're very promising too. So if we have more effective therapies, it might change the way this outcome would be when we look at this question. So Dr. Huang, I want to thank you for this discussion today about alopecia areata. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. I also really want to thank my co-authors on this project, including Hemin Lee, Arash Mostagimi, Natish Chaudhry, because it was a wonderful collaboration to put this project together. I'm Dr. Ade Adamson, and I've been speaking with Dr. Huang about treatment patterns of alopecia areata in the United States. You can find a link to the paper in this episode's description. This episode was produced by Daniel Murrow at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening. Catch you on the next episode of the JAMA Dermatology Podcast.